Brian Canham, yes. Pseudo Echo. Welcome back with, uh, look, you know, two Thank albums you. in one year. I'm, look, I'm, I'm just not used to saying Pseudo Echo with new music. It's been way too long, bro. Uh, it, it doesn't get bandied around much, the, <laughs> that, that uh, catchphrase. And then you pumped out two in one year. Yeah, pretty much, with with a... A surprise third album, maybe later this year or, or at the, uh, well, we are later this year, probably early next year, so, yeah. Oh, you were serious about the third album, were you? Yeah, I'm serious. <laughs> well, well, that's another story. I, I thought, no, 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 you it, can't. It was, it's archival. It's, it was archived material, so, yeah. But okay. unlike um, the, the new one's new. Yeah. Well, firstly, uh, After Party, congratulations. I mean, wow, what a cruise Thank album you. this one is. And uh, cool. it's yeah. a real maturity of sound as well, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I guess it is. Um, it's been a long time between drinks. So, um, you know, lots has happened in my life and lots happened musically and uh, with everything in all aspects. So, um, yeah, it's, it, it was a... The funny thing how it came about because it came about before the start of this COVID thing and um, we were just sort of archiving and going through things and we said look we need to you know maybe we should bring out a bunch of our instrumentals and put them all together and and make an instrumental album and then I had some new ideas and new bits and pieces started and um, I went through those and then sort of bit by bit they became more than instrumentals and a couple of them had lyrics and and then before you know it, then the lockdown started. So I said, well, look, you know, I've been um, sort of always using the excuse that I don't have time to do an album because I'm always touring. And all of a sudden I had no excuse anymore. So um, uh, my wife, Raquel, who's our manager, um, cracked a whip and said, new album, I think. So <laughs> that was it. That was the start of it. And then there was no turning back. And, and strangely enough, I didn't have a time constraint this time like I usually do. So... Um, mm. I was able to really immerse myself and really just get deep. I'm conjuring up uh, bits of Brian Eno, bits of Giorgio Moroto. Uh, it is a very different pseudo echo sounding record. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, look, you know, when you look through our history, you you, you can see there's always an evolution. It's, it's constantly changing. Maybe not dramatically every time, but there's it's it's always progressing and um, evolving and, and it's something I've always um, done but not really consciously it's just it grows the music grows with me so um, this time around um, you know out here in, in, the, in the forest um, I'm chilling out to lots of music and I'm getting my head around all sorts of alternative acts and um, you know I think they, they take their toll they have an influence on me and um, and, uh, and uh, you know the end product is the uh, after party yeah, well, you're uh, uh, talking about the forest there. Uh, this album was made in the Yarra Ranges. My favourite wine comes out of the Yarra Valley. So, uh, you know, we're getting good music and good wine coming from the Yarra area at the moment. There's all sorts of good stuff out here, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I won't like the, uh, <laughs> yeah, the song uh, All of the Above, let's uh, talk about that because that has become sort of the focal track for um, the Art yeah. Party album. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, that was a song that I had um, I had started some time ago. Uh, just a skeleton idea of it and um, bits and pieces. And um, I, I, it was it was my wife Raquel who heard it one day and said, um, you know, why have I never heard this song before? It was I was just going through tapes and and old songs, and um, I said oh, I never really finished it. I never never really thought there was a spot for it. I didn't know where it was going to go, and. Um, so I, I got it out, I reviewed it, and I, I thought about the lyrics and thought about, you know, melodies and, and uh, just how I was going to approach it and um, belted it back into shape. And I'd already written the lyrics and um, I said, God, it's, it's very poignant for the time. You know, it's like, you know, when I listen to these words, um, they are very fitting. And it wasn't written intentionally with this time frame in mind, but it was a personal experience. I, I, I uh, lost somebody who was uh, uh, close to us and um, 
they were young. They were very young, and and it it made me sort of ponder my whole life. Um, I was going through a dark patch at the time too, just before I remarried, and um, I, I just I thought, you know, it, it's sad when um, people give up on stuff, uh, you know, give up on life before they really have a fair crack at it. And I think there's always a last ditch effort and, um, you know, to have a permanent solution to a temporary problem is often the case. So I um, stood out on the outside and looked back at what, what had happened to this young person. And in a way, it was some, some respects, it was reflective on my own life too. As I said, I was going through a very dark patch in my life. And I think it was like a message to myself to pick up the pieces and um, and give it a go again, and, and don't give up, don't be defeated. The uh, the vocals on the album um, are very interesting, and the the, the track uh, Quasar, I almost had to listen to it twice to go, is that Brian? What were you, what were you doing with your vocal on that track? Well, the thing is. Um, the style that most people know my vocal to be, um, the deep sort of brooding sound of um, Autumnal Park, for instance, um, it's a theatrical style singing. It's, it's not my natural singing. It's, it's, it's something that is stylistic to the band. And over the years, it's sort of become less of what my style is about. Um, and so when I approached the vocals on this album, I, I just sung the way I sing. I just sung from my heart and the way I really feel. So um, there are hints of that old brooding sound in there every now and then. But, yeah, I used a higher register. I sung in a lot of falsetto range a lot of times. Um, and, and the whole Quasar song, um, it, I was just messing around in my studio with a loop pedal playing little guitar riffs, and I started that guitar harmony block that repeats throughout the song. And I had that, and I um, sort of quickly said to myself, "This is um, this is a cool cool riff. I should do something with this." So I, I opened up my studio, and I just started recreating it again in the studio. So it was that it was made right here in the cabin. So it was very sentimental to us. Mm. I absolutely love what you've done with "Love and Adventure," right? like a thirty-five-year-old <laughs> song, and. Yeah. It's, it's it's aged very gracefully, hasn't it? It's almost like a crooner version of Love and Adventure. It's always been one of my faves, and um, there are a few versions of it that I've done over the years, and um, even the acoustic one on Acoustica. Um, and then I, same again, I had this little idea of that song, just a bed track going around that I tried some years back, and then I sort of dragged it back out and said, I, I could revisit this. This is... This is in the flavour of this new album. And um, and I thought for a while, oh, but then it's, it's an old song on a new album. But then I thought, well, what does it matter? You know, it's 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 fitting, it's the sound. And and I got to do it the way I sort of always wanted to do it. So it was um, quite fulfilling to, to, to get it to that, to that, um, to that uh, what do you call it, that uh, progression in its life. Like you said, it's an old song and it's, um, you know, it, it was nice to take away all of the sort of um, 80s sound and then um, rebrand it. Because uh, I guess the, the original Love and Adventure was your most successful album, at least uh, from a sales perspective. That was yeah. pretty sure that was a platinum album in Australia, but it was also a gold record in Canada for you, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's all these surprise uh, accolades from around the world that sometimes I forget about, but, yeah, they're there. We tend to forget about uh, the success that Pseudo Echo had around the world uh, back in the mm. 80s. And, uh, gee, you, you got to go on some pretty impressive television shows back in the day, didn't you? Uh, Joan Rivers, for one. <laughs> Dick yeah, Clark. yeah, television. <laughs> yeah, Dick Clark, <laughs> top of the pop. So oh, crazy, yeah. Joan Rivers was probably the most um, uh, tense because it's live. Uh, you rehearse all day. Um they, they they want you to play live and they want you to chat live. And, um, you know, as a young lad, I was pretty pretty aspy at the best of times. <laughs> Sometimes the things would have come out of my mouth. And I remember the quote um, Joan said to me, um, she said, is there anything that your family have asked you to bring back specifically from, from the States? And, I, and um, 
I, I don't know if anyone answered, but I sort of looked at her and, and um, Joan Rivers on one side and Joan Van Ark on the other, and I just said, um, my mum said to me, don't bring back any diseases. <laughs> and they, they both just sort of choked but then burst out laughing. So I thought, and then I sort of, as they were laughing, I thought, uh, did I just say that? <laughs> Live television for you. That would be a very appropriate answer for 2020 had you been in exactly that same position in American interview right now. That's right. It all comes around. What about the Dick Clark experience? What was that like? Did you Were, were you even aware, being as young as you were at the time, who, who uh, he was? You know what? That's the funny thing. I sort of vaguely knew him from the bandstand re- reruns and things like that, but um, I don't remember much about it. There's always a big kerfuffle around backstage and before you go on. Uh, these shows, you know, they're, they're high standard. They, there's no mess ups or anything. But I, I do remember Dick coming backstage and, and sort of chatting with us and congratulating us and um, welcoming us to the show. So um, that was nice. I don't think the guys knew who he was, but, you know, it, it was it was cool. Yeah. Did you get photos of like with the, the, the Jones and Dick and all of that back in the day? <laughs> We didn't get any photos of anything when we were over there. Um, it was pre, pre-iPhone, obviously, pre-mobile phones and cameras. So unless you had your camera with you, your, your, your proper camera. And, um, I, yeah, we, didn't, we hardly took any photos of, of all these uh, incredible encounters and, and experiences. I thought you would have had somebody following you around with a slate and a chisel, just, you know, drawing it on a Did cave. You with me then? Raquel would have snapped them all up, and I didn't know Raquel back then. So, yeah, she does some amazing photos. We, you know, we see on your Facebook site. She really knows how to style you, doesn't she? There must be a lot of yeah, work that yeah. goes into creating Brian Canham every day. <laughs> what are you trying to say? <laughs> no, um, she's uh, she's great. Yeah, she's had great experience in modelling and photography and makeup and all that stuff, and uh, her styling and all that's really good. So. Yeah, wonderful. I'm very lucky to have that. As you said, uh, 2020, we would have seen you on the road a lot. We're not seeing you at all on the road this year. But in the uh, recent years that I have been seeing you in there, there have been some musical surprises in the set list. Um, Send Me an Angel, for a start, real life. (laughs) That became quite a regular part of your set. How did that happen? It did indeed. Yeah, you know what? That started because um, going back some years now, 10 years or so, um, I had a band that I was doing at the start before anyone jumped on all those sort of 80s uh, rehashed bands. I, I did put one together myself and um, and it was quite serious. It wasn't a spoof. I, I was quite serious about it. And I wanted to be real high standard when the performers came up and, and sung their songs. And, and David was one of the artists that I had on the bill with me. And so I produced this track lavishly, <laughs> painstakingly. Um, for David to use and um, so we did that and when that dissolved I still had the the, the tracks and I think I said to David I said uh, maybe I should just do it do it in our set and uh, and David was quite happy about that because he wasn't touring much and um, you know sticking over the song and it's good for David and um, and it was good for us I said you know so many people used to come up to me and say you know their favorite song of, of, of Pseudo Echo was Sammy and Angel so, so I just went <laughs> we'll just go with it they must have been um, around the same time, uh, Send Me an Angel and Listening by Pseudo Echo. Uh, yeah. Because the, the, I, I, real I was a D on for it. a very short yeah. amount of time and played both of those songs, I recall. Yeah, they, they must have been within months of each other. And um, and they were a bit of an influence to me. I used to go and see their band and, um, you know, take notes. So it, it was it's a great feeling doing that song now and uh, it, it has a real history with us. And not only... Uh, did you have that alignment back then? But Send Me an Angel was also a minor hit in the United States, um, you know, as as you broke through with as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's right. Mm. Uh, what about ACDC's Dirty Deeds? How did that come to uh, sort of weave its way into a pseudo echo song? Yeah, that's. Um... It's one of those, it, there are all these riffs that I grew up with, you know, um, belting out on guitar. And um, and then ironically, I'm in a synthesizer band. So um, every now and then I just um, dig back to my past and rip out one of these classic riffs, um, uh, Deep Purple's Black Knight. We throw that in sometimes. Um, 
there used to be some other 80s tracks we threw in there. But, um, yeah, the, a lot of the 70s anthems I like to, to recreate with the suits and then do our version of it. I can't think of actually hearing you do Black Knight. That would... Uh... You've got to hear that. You've got it. Actually, I think we're posting it shortly. <laughs> Pseudo Echo play the hits of Deep Purple. Maybe that's the third album, yep. Brian. Oh. Rocker. Well, we'll wait and see. Well, the uh, the new album is yeah. After Party. Uh, very, very, very tasty stuff. Congratulations on uh, some fine uh, new music from Pseudo Echo, Brian Cannon.